Welcome everybody to this uh, last talk uh, today before uh, student teachers. And uh, it's uh, my pleasure to in introduce Ahmed Chemori, who is a science researcher at uh, the French National Center of Scientific Research in the lab LIRM in Montpellier, where he is also a professor in Montpellier University. He's a researcher in uh, automatic control and robotics. And uh, today, Ahmed will uh, present, introduce you, us uh, at uh, how bio-inspired underwater robots uh, can uh, support uh, human divers during, during their activity. And uh, this presentation is in some way a continuum of uh, the previous presentation by Maria. And uh, so, Please, Ahmed, I give you the floor and tell us. Thank you very much. Do you hear me well? So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, session. So first of all, let me thank the organizers of this school for the invitation. So it's, the, uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today to present my lecture about control of bio-inspired autonomous underwater vehicles. And the idea is to go uh, towards uh, a diver, uh, diver tracking problem. So first of all, before we start the heart of the presentation, let me first introduce our lab, our institution. And before that, our city, which is Montpellier. So Montpellier is a, a city situated in the south of France. Uh, very nice city. So it is well known by a lot of things. I will just mention maybe two or three. First of all, so the oldest faculty of medicine in Europe and maybe in the world is situated in Montpellier, founded around 1220. Second, it's the eighth biggest city in Montpellier, it's the capital of the aero department. And also we have a lot of students. So actually the population is like, like around 300,000 people. And among these people, we have like 70,000 70, students at the, uh, at the University of Montpellier. Uh, then our laboratory is called LIRM, and LIRM is coming from Laboratory of Computer Science, Informatics, Robotics, and Microelectrics at Montpellier. Uh, the labs in France, they have a certain specificity, which is the following. Actually, we belong to, as any uh, research lab in the world, to a university. Actually, it's the University of Montpellier, but not only. So it belongs also to another research institution called CNRS. It's the National Research Council. And actually, our lab, we are more than 440 persons working in three departments. The first one, which is the biggest computer science, and then the Department of Robotics and Microelectronics. Now, let me say a few words about what I'm doing. So actually, I'm interested in control of complex robotic systems for uh, different applications. And I will just briefly introduce those applications and uh, maybe I can briefly explain why they are complex uh, robotic systems. First of all, I am working on the control of underactuated uh, robots. And those robots, so they have less control inputs than degrees of freedom. This is why we say that they are underactuated. And the idea is to control a certain number of degrees of freedom with less degrees of freedom in the control. Then the second application, it concerns parallel kinematic manipulators. So these are manipulators. And they are very challenging in terms of a control because of a lot of reasons. One of these reasons, it's the closed kinematic chain. So imagine that you have a dynamic model of a robotic manipulator and you close the chain. So you will add these constraints to close the chain and the model become more and more complex. Uh, another issue here, it's the inverse of the under actuation. So parallel robots, most of them, they are redundantly actuated or over actuated. It means that they have more control inputs than degrees of freedom, more actuators. And this may generate an internal effort that may damage the mechanical structure of the robots. So this is why when we design control, we have to pay attention about it. Then the next application, it concerns wearable robot, uh, robots or exoskeletons. And here the idea is also to design controllers for this kind of mechanical structures, why they are complex robotic systems, actually, because first, it's direct interaction, physical interaction with the human. And then we have to deal with this problem. We have to deal with the safety problem because we are manipulating something which is directly in contact with the human. And the control problems are very challenging. 
And then the, the next application, it's legged robots in general. I worked before on this kind of robots, bike robots. And starting from now, and in cooperation with Maria, we start working on another kind of robots, the quadrupeds that you can see here. And Maria showed you one challenging example of control of these robots to work in a muddy environment. And the last application, it's the topic of today. And I'm interested in control of autonomous underwater vehicles. And today I focus on bio-inspired underwater vehicles. So here is the roadmap of the presentation of today. I will start with a general introduction where I will introduce the basics of bio-inspired robotics. Then I will focus on underwater bio-inspired robotics. Then I will introduce uh, with slightly more details uh, about the UCAP underwater vehicle. And then I will focus on the controllers. Actually, we develop a lot of controllers. I will try to uh, just present some of them. First one is the priority-based controller, and here is to deal the problem of ender actuation that we have in our case. Then we have acoustic-based feedback control, we have the vision-based control, we have the data fusion control, and we have the fault tolerance control. And I will conclude my presentation by the end. So first of all, let me introduce a very basic definition. What is a, what is a bio-inspired robotics? So it's a research domain or field interdisciplinary between robotics and biology. And the idea, it consists of two uh, areas. So the first one is biomimetic and the robotic uh, and biorobotic modeling and analysis. And the second one is biomimetic. So for the biomimetic, what is the idea is to draw inspiration from biology. Uh, and the idea is to apply those uh, aspects in the case to resolve some engineering problems in robotics. So this is the first uh, case. and. Uh, Examples, we have a lot of examples where we design uh, underwater robots or any other robots based on biology idea, motion control, which can be bio-inspired, sensing, which can be bio-inspired, and also the actuation. Then the second topic or the second area is the biorobotic modeling analysis. And here the idea is the inverse. What we mean by the inverse? So it means the application of robotic models to study or adjust biological issues. One of the examples, it can be to use, for instance, a model of biomimetic robotic fish to study the swimming dynamics of a fish. So, and then one of the aspects when we talk about bio-inspired robotics is the morphology. So, and we can see a lot of, a lot of realization of robots, as you can see here with different forms. And the morphology here, it's bio-inspired from the nature. Then, it's not only the morphology, so we have other aspects also. We have uh, uh, a robot design, we have robot control, we have actuation and sensing, and we have also the problem of locomotion. So let's focus on the last one. So if we are interested in locomotion, so we have three cases. We have the case of ground robots, we have the case of aerial robots and underwater robots. Let's take the case of ground robots. For the ground robots, Actually, the human, he created the wheel. So we can use the wheel to actuate robots and to control them to move in the environment. So for the bio-inspired robotics, let's, for, let's forget about the wheel. And it's, instead of the wheel, we can use the leg because actually the human use the leg, the animals, they use the leg, the insects, they use the leg. So the idea is to use legs actually in the design. And some animals, they are limbless, so there is no legs. We can also design the bio-inspired robots in this direction. Now, aerial vehicles, drones or any aerial vehicle, actually the classical way is to use a propeller like that. And as I said, for biology or bio-inspired, we will forget about this. And instead we will use flapping wings. So the use of flapping wings can create, we can create a robots that can fly and they are bio-inspired. Then for underwater, the classical way is to use a propeller like that. And also for bio-inspired, let's forget about this. And instead of this, we can use fins because sea animals, they use fins to move in their environment. Now, bio-inspired underwater robotics. Let me introduce this very simple classification of marine vehicles so that you know most of them here. So the first class is the class of ROVs. We have an underwater vehicle. We have the tether that can link the control system on the boat to the underwater vehicle. We have the class of the crawlers. It can go up. On the, on the sea button, and they are controlled to move in the environment. They can manipulate, they can help to install some infrastructures, and they are very stable because they are in contact with the sea button. 
Then we have the case of AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles. There is no tether. They are completely autonomous. And they have a limitation in terms of autonomy. And then to resolve this problem of autonomy, we have the case of the gliders where we can make very long term missions. And then we have the case of autonomous, autonomous surface vehicles. And the last class that interests me here is the class of bio inspired underwater vehicles. So this can be considered as a class of marine vehicles. Now let's focus on this class and let's start with the definition. What is a bio-inspired underwater vehicle? So a bio-inspired underwater robot or vehicle is a robot designed based on biological ideas. And uh, why we use biological ideas? We use the, those ideas to address technological problems, sometimes all called biomimetics. And they have a certain number, number of features. So actually, they have a, a bio-inspired shape or actuation or propulsion or sensing. And we, have, we can find a lot of examples, actually. So we can design bio-inspired underwater robots to be inspired from fish, turtles, eels, crabs, and so on and so on. And some of them, they are designed based on modular design. So they design uh, a part, then a second, the same, they duplicate this part, they connect all of them, and they create like a snake, maybe underwater vehicle. Where the, those robots are used, actually, I have here uh, listed some of the potential applications where they can be used. The first application, it can be the data collection. Data collection, it means, for instance, you want to measure the quality of water in a lake, you can use this kind of robots, or you want to, de to detect the source of pollution in a place. So they can be used also. So most of the time, they can be equipped with cameras that so we can do video footage or inspection or monitoring or any facility. And also, they can be used to study a new sensing methods or actuation methods. We can classify those bio-inspired underwater, underwater vehicles or underwater robots as follows. So we have first the class of uh, those robots that use undulatory fins. And here you have some examples. So they have fins, and they, by undulation of those fins, they can control the motion of the vehicle. So this is the first class. You have some examples. Then we have another class where they use fins, and actually they are based on the oscillation of those fins to control the motion of the vehicle. And here, here, here also we have some examples. The next one, we can find even legged underwater by inspired robots. Here you have some examples. They can go underwater, then they can move on the sea bottom. And we have other designs like E-like underwater vehicles. And the last example, it's something which human-like. Actually, it has the morphology of a human, like humanoid robot, which has two arms. And this robot can be controlled by an operator on the surface. And this operator has a feedback. And this, uh, this feedback is coming from optic, so the operator can feel the contact force that the robot is manipulating during the mission. Where they can be used? So I have mentioned some applications that they can be used for underwater archaeology, for instance. They can be used for diver following or diver cooperation because they are human friendly. They are, can be used for fish monitoring or fish farmers monitoring, and they can be also used for military applications. Now, some examples. I will show you just a small video and the, the examples, they are around here. You can see them. So you have the first one here from MIT. So it, it is composed of two parts. So here the front part, which is rigid, and the rear part, which is flexible. And we have actuation system here to change the orientation of the tail here. And there is a propeller at the end of the tail. And by combining, so the control of this propeller and the control of the flexibility of this rear part, so it can be controlled. The Rex here from Boston Dynamics, is, it has like six, uh, six legs. They, it can work and it can also be controlled to swim underwater. And the idea is to control also the, the motion of those fins to move underwater. Madeleine from Stanford University, almost the same as UCAT, but there are some differences. Here, the, it, it is equipped with four fins also. We control the motion of the four fins to control the motion of the body. Galati here, it uses the undulating actuation, as you can see here. And as you can see, the motion that we can obtain, it's very smooth, very smooth motion that we can dive, we can turn, and we can move around. Uh, 
uh, and it uses this uh, this undulation action, which is controlled through the the generation of a wave, and then you control you can control the parameters of this wave to move inside weather. The same example from ETH, but here it uses more undulating fins. Actually, it uses four more undulating fins, and it can move also in the same way, in very smooth way underwater. So those are some examples. We have other examples. Uh, inspired uh, by fish. So the next one that we will see here, it's uh, a robot fish. And the same concept here, the tail is uh, flexible. We can control the motion of the tail to orient, correctly the vehicle and to move underwater. And we have some examples. So Maria has uh, shown some amphibious underwater robots that can move on the, on the ground and, and it can swim also. And this is the case of RoboCrab. So RoboCrab, as you can see here, it, it is an, an amphibious transition walking here. It moves on the ground, and then it, it, when it is inside the water, it can swim. <coughs> and the last example, it's the aqua jellyfish uh, designed by Festo that we will see here in the next part of the video. As you can see here, the motions. So this is just to introduce some examples to instant um, the concept and also to see the diversity. So a lot of designs, different designs, and most of them, as you can see, at least they have a bio-inspired or it's very like the biology. So they are moving exactly in the same way. Uh, then, now let me introduce UCAT. So UCAT has been introduced by Maria. Let me maybe say a few words regarding UCAT. So actually UCAT, it is uh, an underwater, bio-inspired underwater vehicle. It was designed within this research European project. And the main, uh, the main objective or aim of design of this underwater vehicle is to help archaeologues. And the idea is to go inside the shipwreck and you can imagine all the challenges if you want to go inside a confined environment. So this is the basic idea. And then the other example or the other problem that we may just to explain here, so as I said, most of the underwater vehicles, they use propellers to move, okay? And actually, if we see if we see the example of the case of sea animals, so they use fins. So the idea is coming from that. So instead of using uh, propellers, so the idea is to design robot based on a fin actuation system. So now it depends on the number of fins, the design, it can be just one fin in the tail, as we have seen in the case of the fish, now it's the case of turtle bio-inspired underwater vehicle, and we have decided to use four fins. And the four fins, as you can see here, these are the green parts, and they are made of silicon, so they are flexible. And we obtain this design of UCAT. Here are some parameters or some features of this underwater vehicle. One of the features is designed for archaeology. It is a low-cost underwater vehicle. It is equipped with a camera such that we can identify objects of interest. And it is a small, at the same time, small and highly maneuverable. And it, it is characterized by no propellers. So actually the actuation system, it uses fins. And the, because if we use propellers, this may restrict the visibility underwater and especially for the intended application of uh, shipwreck inspection. And also by this design, we have a silent motion. So we have no disturbance of the sediments. And also it's an AUV, so there is no tether because you want to go inside the shipwreck. If you use a tether, it will be a huge problem. This is why it's a tether. And then it is actuated by four fins. Uh, actually, we can move in six degrees of freedom, okay? But it is underactuated. But also it can be overactuated. It depends on how we will see the problem. I will say more during the presentation to, to understand why it is at the same time underactuated and overactuated and why we can control all the six degrees of freedom. First of all, let me introduce the, te the technical aspects of UCAT. So it is equipped with uh, some sensors. It, we have three hydrophones here. So you will, and we designed some controllers based on acoustic measurements. So we use the hydrophones. UCAT is equipped with distance sensors. It is equipped with a camera. Also, we designed vision-based controllers. And it is equipped with an IMU to measure the uh, orientation of the vehicle and a uh, pressure sensor to measure the depth. And then it has four actuators. And the actuators, they are inside the vehicle. So four DC brushless motors actuating the four fins of the vehicle. 
And this has something that we never used. I, I never used, we never used this. It's a buoyancy control system inside that we never used. Actually, for, for diving, we used the fins at the same time while we control the other degrees of freedom. So what we have, I think it has this buoyancy control system that may be used. So how it starts this cooperation between France and Estonia? Actually, I visited the lab of Maria a few years ago, maybe eight years ago. So, and we start discussing about a, a research project that we can make together. So, uh, between the Center for Biorobotics in Estonia and our laboratory, Lirm, and we applied for a first funding. We get the first PhD proje project, and we get some funding from the French side, from the Estonian side, and we start working together. And from that, we continue working up to now, and we got, we did, we, we took a lot of students, so master students, and also we have actually a joint PhD between France and Estonia. The students will defend in December, and they will get double degree, a degree from France, PhD from France, and PhD from Estonia. And this is the thesis of the wallet, and we are continuing to work with other students in the forthcoming weeks and months. Now, before introducing the control aspects regarding this underwater vehicle and the challenges, let me first introduce some control issues. Why it is very complex to control this underwater vehicle. And first of all, let me introduce the first control issue. Why we use fins instead of propellers? Here, let me introduce this video that illustrates the concept and that will show you the limitation of using a propeller. This is our underwater vehicle in Montpellier, in France. We are moving here, controlling the vehicle to go down. And it uses a propeller, and as you can see here, we have a camera, and the the propeller is disturbing completely the sediments. So if you are using a camera, you cannot control the vehicle because not because you cannot see anything. So this is a problem. Now let's see an illustration of the field actuation. Actually, this is the field actuation of UCAT, and as you can see, it goes down. It is very close to the bottom, and as you can see, the motion it's there is very silent. So there is no sediment disturbance. This, this is one of the reasons why we designed the vehicle based on this fin actuation. We have another idea also, maybe using flexible fins, we can have less energy. Maybe we need less energy to move, but we didn't, we never proved this, we never worked on this. It can be one of the future works possibility. Second control issue. Let, let me now introduce the control and explain why the vehicle is actually under actuated. Under actuated, since it has just only four fins, and let me explain the six degrees of freedom where we can move. Actually, you have an illustration. You have two things. First of all, you have to choose the orientation of the fins. You have the zero direction ang angle. You, you orient the, the fin in this direction. This is the zero. And they try to oscillate around this value. And uh, for instance, if you move, you want to move along the third direction, you have just to orient the fins like that and then control them, and you push the vehicle to move forward along the surge. And the same can be applied for all the six degrees of freedom of the vehicle. So this is understand. Now, the problem, if I ask you one question, if I want to move along X and Y at the same time, or X and Y and Z, or X and Y and Z and the pitch, how can I orient the, the, the fins, and what will be the control action in that time? So this is, it is under actuated. We cannot control, uh, apparently like that, we cannot control using this configuration, the six degrees of freedom are not, uh, at the same time. This is not possible. Because why? Actually, if you understand, here we choose an orientation of the fins. It means the zero direction is choosed. It's here and it's fixed. It's one value. And we try to oscillate around this value. And the control parameter, actually, it can be one of the two parameters, which are, the amplitude, if you increase the amplitude of oscillation, you increase the thrust and you can control the vehicle. This is one parameter. Then you can keep the amplitude constant, but you increase the frequency. So either you can use the frequency or the amplitude to control the vehicle. However, we cannot use in this configuration by choosing the zero direction angle for the four fins and using of this one, two parameters, we cannot control the six degrees of freedom at the same time. We can control them with another way. I will explain it later. So this is one of the uh, challenges, and it is underactuated. The third control issue. Actually, if you look carefully, the body of the vehicle, it's like any underwater vehicle, an AUV or an ROV, no problem. So we can use the Fossens model to model the dynamics of the vehicle. There is no problem. But otherwise, we have to pay attention to the fins. 
We have to take into account the dynamics of the fins. And this is the challenge. The fins are flexible. If you want to compute a very precise model of the fins and you take into account the flexibility, it will be very, very complex. If you want to finite time, finite elements method, for instance, you have a very huge uh, complex mathematical model that cannot be used for control issues or for control implementation because of the limitation of the computing time. So we have to choose a model at, least, uh, at the same time well representing the, the fins and at the same time that can be implemented on a real control system. Uh, actually, we started with something with very easy. Actually, we, cho we said that we will fix the frequency. The frequency is constant and we try to use the amplitude as a control input. And the model can be written something like that. And here the idea is to invert the model because actually here the first variable that you can see is the thrust generated by a thin, uh, which is dependent on the amplitude, which is the control input. And if you control, if you compute, for instance, the, the, the vector tau of the control inputs to move the vehicle, so you have a vector of dimension six, and from this, you use the configuration matrix to go back to the thrust that should be generated by all the fins. And from this, you have to go to the amplitude. So in this case, you have to inverse this model. First of all, we start with a very basic test. We do an identification and we obtain something like that. So this is what we obtain. So the blue curve here, it's the thrust. And from this thrust, and this thrust is for a specific frequency of two hertz. And what we did here, we increased the amplitude and for each value of the amplitude, we measure the thrust. And the mean value of this, it's here. We have different points. And then we try to identify the model. So we, we obtain a model, which is uh, a nonlinear model, and you have been inverted in a numerical way. And we obtain here the amplitude. So from the thrust, the desired thrust, we can control, we can compute the desired amplitude, which is represented by this numerical value. And we used it in different control situations, in different controllers. It works, but it has a lot of limitations. But to start with, it was okay. Then we have the last control issue. As Maria mentioned before, we can control the vehicle. We can choose two configurations. Actually, the first configuration is the hover control. The hover control, it depends on the orientation of the fins that should be oriented like that. And the second one is the cruise control where the fins should be oriented like that. What is the difference between those two uh, control modes? So for the hover mode, if you are interested to do an inspection and you want to position the robot at a specific position and you stay with the precision at that position, so this first mode, it's better. However, if you want to move from one, one point to another, it's better to use the cruise control because the pushing force here, the thrust, it's bigger in this case than this case. So these are the two control modes. And then we can also show the configuration of the fees for both modes. This is for the hover mode. And for hover mode, we can control the six degrees of freedom. And the six degrees of freedom, pay attention, separately. So each degree of freedom is controlled alone like that. And we have to choose the orientation, the good orientation of the fins. And then we control the, the frequency or the amplitude to control the vehicle along those directions. Now, for the case of the cruise mode, there is a problem. We can control only five degrees of freedom. There is one degree of freedom that we cannot control. It's this way. Whatever you do, you cannot generate a thrust pushing the robot in this way direction. And this is also a control issue. Now let me talk about the control solution. So as I, as I told you, we did a lot of controllers that we have implemented, we tested, and I just me explain how we proceed. So we proceed first to uh, design some control components. I want to control just one degree of freedom. I want to design a controller. We did a lot of controllers, started from like the classical controls, like the PID, and go into the most uh, advanced or nonlinear controllers like a robust integral of the sign of error, which is rise controller, adaptive inverse dynamics, uh, sliding mode control, and so on. And then using those components, we try to design a high level controller. And the high level controller, actually, the first uh, thing that we did, we apply those components to control just one degree of freedom. And then we try to control more degrees of freedom, but it, it was not so easy. It's not a straightforward. You control one degree of freedom. Okay, I want to control two or three. It's not possible. Straightforward. So we need to do something to control more degrees of freedom. So we try to develop something which is called priority-based control. And this control scheme, it enables you to control two and even three 
degrees of freedom at the same time. I will explain you later on the basic principle of this how and how we did to control more degrees of freedom uh, uh, since the vehicle is underactu underactuated. Then we have, we try to use the measurements that we have on the vehicle. We use the sensors that we have. We used, uh, we designed an uh, acoustic based control. We used the camera to design a vision based control. And we try then to uh, compare, to, um, to compile both of them to use uh, something which is do, which will do the data fusion and the deep learning when we combine both of them to control the vehicle. And we did also a fault tolerance control. And the last one, it's the control allocation for six degrees of freedom. That I will not present. <laughs> it's under publication. This one is not published yet, but I will present all the previous control schemes. And to proceed, first, we, uh, we tested a lot of controllers in a simulator of the vehicle, as you can see here. Then we start testing in a swimming pool in a very controlled environment. Then we try to test in open water in real conditions. And finally, we test even the vehicle to show that it's humanly friendly. Uh, uh, the vehicle swimming near children, as you can see here. Let me show you the first results. The first result, as you can see here, it's open loop control. And actually, it's a joystick used by the human. And the human is controlling the vehicle. And you will see the different degrees of freedom and how the vehicle can move. So it's OK. We can move the vehicle in all the directions, in all the six degrees of freedom. But pay attention. There are some issues that we will observe through this video. So this is the starting point here. As you can see, the robot is, is start moving. And however, during the motion, we notice it here that there is something. Look to the video. There is something like that. So the, the roll, it's not stable. There is an oscillation in the roll. The robot is smooth, smooth, swimming around here. It can change the direction very quickly. Just here, reorient the fins. It can move in along the Y axis. As you can see, he can move in all the six directions. There is no problem. And it's controlled by human, as you can see. And you can see the motion, how it is. However, if you notice, there is a roll motion, which is not very stable. As you can see, there is oscillating. It is oscillating. Here you can see the motion of the fins. You can see that they are flexible, and they are moving the body of the robot. And we can move up, down, and so on. The human is here and using the joysticks to control the vehicle. We can control the vehicle on the surface. We can dive. We can control all the six degrees of freedom. However, as I said, there is a problem of some of the degrees of freedom. They are oscillating. Some of them, they are naturally stable, but some of them, they are oscillating like the roll. And this is coming for the control of the fins. If you look to the fins, the right and the left fins, they are controlled, but there is no synchronization between the motions of the both fins. This is why it generates a torque around the roll. And this is we have the vehicle is doing something like that. So this is the problem. So this is the first test that we did in open loop control. Now, let me try to show you how it works when we close the loop. We started with the PID controller. Here we close the loop and we try to control one degree of freedom. Very easy. We are controlling the depth. We are moving up and down. You have joint just to choose the orientation of the fins. If you want to go down like that and you control the amplitude of the frequency, you move down. And if you want to go up, you do the inverse. And as you can see, both uh, fins on the right and the left, they are very well synchronized and the roll is stable and the vehicle is stable also. So this is in a swimming pool. Then we try to go further. Let's try to do uh, some tests in real conditions. And we try to do some tests in open water here. It was in Estonia. And we uh, the same first, which we started with one degree of freedom controlling just the depth. We defined some predefined trajectories going from the surface to two meters depth. We stay there and then we try to go back to the surface. And uh, starting from the surface and going down to follow some uh, predefined trajectory first. Now it moves slightly up because we want to start exactly from zero. Then it goes down until it reaches the desired depth. As I told you, I want to move down, I do this. I want to move up, I do this. When the error is equal to zero, I will do this. So if you see the orientation like that, it means that the tracking error is around zero. The, he tried to stabilize and then we apply an external disturbance. We try to pull the robot to the surface and we release it and instantaneously, as you can see, the fees are reoriented and controlling the vehicle to go back around the desired value of the depth uh, here, which is around two meters. And even the motion going from up to down, as I told you, it was a trajectory, a small trajectory to be followed. We stay a certain time here and then we finish the mission by going up to the surface. Then 
we try to go further to control more degrees of freedom, uh, at least two or three degrees of freedom. And then we decided to design another controller and we had this idea to use a priority-based. What is a priority-based controller? It's actually summarized here and it is nothing as a classical controller, but we add something. What we add? Actually, uh, we add something which is here. Here, the desired trajectories, they are classical. We add something here. And we said that the robot can move from one point to another. We can follow like a square trajectory, for instance. In this case, we have to control um, uh, with precision the search. If the robot has to stop at a certain point at turn, for instance, we have to give pri more priority to the depth and the U. He has to keep the depth and also control the U. And then we cannot do both of them at the same time. This is why we try to introduce the parameter alpha here. And based on the value of the parameter, we give more or less priority to one degree of freedom than the other. It means that if we increase alpha, we give more priority to the surge control. If the uh, human is pushing uh, fully the vehicle, it will generate a big alpha and we'll concentrate more on the control of the, of the surge and we give less priority to the U and the, and the, and the depth. If we apply a small values of the control along the surge, at that time, we give more priority to the, to the depth and the U, and we use this to modulate the control action. So we can we compute the control action with any controller, then we use this, what we call them, it's like membership functions in fuzzy logic. And we combine this with any control, with different controllers, and we try. Here is just another representation of this block diagram. We can see the sequence. Here is the odometry node where we use the IMU, the pressure sensor, and the dynamics here of the vehicle is computed based on the measurement. Then we have the controller here, which rate tau and alpha. So the vector of the control input and this parameter alpha. And here we take the measurement from the joystick control. I mean, the, the operator is using the joystick and we combine of them. We uh, add saturation on the position and the speed and we add these membership, membership functions, we generate the modulated control input, and then using the trench driver, we compute the zero angle phi, the amplitude A, and the frequency F. And if we use one of them, we fix the frequency and you can use the amplitude. And we use this uh, combined with different controllers. Here, just uh, I give just a, a, a small description. One of the controllers that we designed, everyone here, you know, the PID controller, we designed a nonlinear PID. What is the nonlinear PID? PID? A classical PID it uses fixed gains, KP, KD, KI. You tune them, you fix them constant and use them. Actually, here we designed a PID where the gains are nonlinear, are time varying, and they are depending on the error. So the, this is the proportional gain, which is the decreasing exponentially and constant here. And this is the integral gain. And we can, sorry, the derivative gain. And we combine this nonlinear inside the PID and we try the controller. Here is the priority-based control and the obtained results. What we did, first of all, we did the manual control. We asked the human to control the vehicle to move along this square trajectory, completely manual, using just the joystick. And this is what the human did. You have the tracking of the depth. The robot has to dive until one meter, and then he should move like that, following the trajectory. Here, the tracking of the yaw. In the second case, we have the depth autopilot. We will help the human. So we tell him, okay, don't forget, don't care about the depth. It will be automatically controlled. Please just concentrate on the, um, on the U. So the human, while concentrating on the U, only he did better. And here we have the tracking for a depth, which is automatically controlled, and the U. And the last scenario, we say the human, please have rest. And now the controller will control both the depth and the U. And you can see the result, which is here. So if you compare the best result in terms of tracking of the reference trajectory, it is the depth and the U using the autopilot for both degrees of freedom. So this is the, the result. And then we try to say, okay, what is the, the impact of these membership functions? If we remove them, it will work or no? Look, we have repeated the, the autonomous uh, mode, AUV. And this case, it's the AUV mode, and this is without the priority function. Here we use them. As you can see, the tracking is good. Here the tracking is reduced. So if we remove them, so you can degrade the quality of the tracking of the reference trajectories. Then we try to develop another controller now based on acoustic measurements. Actually, as I told you before, UCAT is equipped with hydrophones. We have three hydrophones, so we decided to control the vehicle to follow a pinger. 
Here we have the acoustic pinger. First of all, we decide to put the pinger at a certain distance from the vehicle, uh, approximately at the same depth, and the vehicle is oriented at any orientation. The pinger is there. He has to localize the pinger using the hydrophones to control the orientation of the U, the depth and the surge, and he has to go to the pinger. So this is the first test. And the second test, because we imagine a cooperation between UCAP and the a diver, so we ask the diver to take the pinger like that and to move around. So the, the human or the diver was moving and your cat was in real time moving uh, to follow in a dynamic way this moving object, which is the, the diver uh, carrying the, the, the pinger. So this is the results, the field experiments for the homing. So we go from the initial position to the uh, pinger position. Here you can see the tracking of the depth and the tracking of the angle that you can see here. We tried a second scenario where we follow the diver, as he told you here, in different positions we go through. Here the control of the depth, the tracking, and also the control of the U. And I will show you a video just to, uh, to understand and to see how it works. So this is the finger that we used. This is UCAB, three hydrophones, and as you can see here, the diver following. So the diver is here, and you can see the finger is here. And we asked the diver to be approximately at two meters, the same depth as the as the as you cut to facilitate. I mean the the signal to go to the hydrophones. And as you can see here, the diver is moving, and you cut is controlling three degrees of freedom. So the depth, the U, and the surge following in real time the diver motion, as you can see here. So this control solution is okay. It's good, but it has a certain problem. The problem of precision. If you have, want to go to a certain position and you arrive at that position, you cannot precisely track the position by the end. This is why we try to do something else. Let's try to use the camera. So the camera is good in terms of precision. We try to follow uh, also a dynamic moving target. So what we did, we did another experiment at Ifrimer. We have our underwater vehicle, this one, Leonard, which is controlled by human. It's an ROV. And we designed a vision-based controller, and it localized the position of Leonar, and in real time, it tried to follow the, v the Leonar moving. And actually, for this scenario, for this experiment, the most challenging uh, situation is when the first vehicle is turning, this is the big problem. So if it goes outside the field of view of the camera, the experiment is finished, and you cannot do anything else. So this is the big issue. And however, here we are trying to tune carefully the gain parameters such that the turning will be fast. As, 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 uh, as soon as the first busy vehicle is turning, so UCAP is reacting very quickly to turn also and to keep the target in the middle of the field of view of the camera. After that, since we have two measurements, so the pinger or the acoustic signal and the vision, we try to combine both. Why? For instance, uh, this is the issue of the camera. I mean, if you don't see the diver, you don't see the target, you cannot follow it. The advantage of the finger, whatever the position is, we can localize the finger and try to combine them. We designed so a data fusion controller and we used uh, combined with deep learning. I will explain why deep learning. And this is the control architecture. You can find in the papers all the details, the mathematical development of the controllers, everything are in the paper. Let me explain just the general concept here. We have the vehicle, which is here. We have the data acquisition here, and we have the acoustic measurement and the camera measurement. And then we do the data fusion. And after doing the data fusion, we have the reference here. We compute the error, and we have designed here a controller. And we have the wrench driver that controls the fins of the vehicle. And here, what happened? I mean, we start the experiments. Uh, if we don't see the diver, we we'll use the finger, we try to localize the diver and try to control the U and to go towards the finger. So this is the first thing. And at the same time, we try to, to check for the camera. Once we detect the diver, we have to switch from the, the acoustic control to the vision-based control. And this is done automatically. And as you can see here, I didn't talk about the deep learning. Where we use deep learning? Actually, we use deep learning in the detection of the diver. So we train uh, a neural network extensively to localize, to detect the diver in a video. We took some videos of divers from internet and we trained the, the network and we use it. And the result was really wonderful. So this is the video that showed camera. Uh, Maria, I will show it again, but explain further. We want to combine the advantages of both sensing, uh, sensing uh, 
aspects. So the visual, the acoustic, data fusion, and we try with the visual uh, tracking first. So the diver is here, you cut is following. As I told you, if we are outside the field of view, there will be a problem, we cannot do anything, and we stop the experiment. So this is the visual tracking first. So the robot cannot track the diver once he leaves the field of view of the camera. So this is the first test. And then we try another test where we use actually the, the finger alone, the, the acoustic signal alone. Acoustic tracking now, and we started with a fixed finger. So the finger is here, it's fixed. We start you cut and you try to follow the finger. And what we notice is when you cut arrives around the desired target, so it turns around because it's not so precise. So this is the issue of uh, acoustic tracking. And then data fusion, actually we combine, so the visual uh, signal and acoustic signal, we start from this position to go to this uh, specific position, which is fixed. So data fusion based tracking here and with a static target. So the target is fixed. And the last scenario, we try to combine those sensing methods as a feedback in the controller and to follow a dynamic moving target. It was the diver. And we try to, to follow the diver, which was holding the finger again. But when we use the camera, the idea is not to detect the finger with the camera. It detects the face of the diver. So data fusion here based for the diver tracking. And as you can see, it was very successful. The diver is moving here and you cast it controlling the depth, the yaw and the surge. And as you can see in real time, it's following the diver and also it's switching between the finger, the acoustic signal and the vision based signal depending on the situation. So if he detects the diver in the field of view, he uses the camera, otherwise he switched to the finger and so on until the end of the experiment. And then the last uh, controller, it was a four-point control. And here, let me talk about the issue that I explained at the beginning. I told you that UCAS is underactuated and it is, or it can be also overactuated. How? Underactuated, I explained. If you choose the zero direction of the fins and you keep just two parameters, you fix like the frequency and you, you use the amplitude as a control input, you have one control input by, by fin. So you have four control inputs six degrees of freedom, it's underactuated. Now, if you say that, okay, I will choose the zero direction as a word variable, and the amplitude is a variable, and the frequency is a variable, you combine the, those three, three multiplied by four, you obtain 12 possibilities. And if for each variable you can take all the possible value, you will have infinity of solutions. So we try to use this redundancy to design a controller and to control the vehicle in this way. And we uh, apply this, uh, this um, control allocation in a controller that will deal with four torian. Actually, we compute the uh, control allocation for the full actu actuated robots for four degrees of four fields. And then we control for a reduced control allocation. It means we suppose one of the fields is not working. So we move from, three, from four to three. And then we can switch between them depending on the situation. And then we use this in the control loop. We designed, the, this is just the fins, the, the front fins and the rear fins, left and right. And for each time, we suppose that there is a problem on one of the fins, we stop it, it's not working. And we try to repeat the experiment to check if the controller is fault torrent. These are the obtained results. As you can see, the blue tracking, it's the nominal case where we have a healthy robot. So four degrees of freedom. And the red one, it's the case where we have here, for instance, the right left fin, which is not working, the left uh, fin, left the, um, the front left fin, and so on and so on. And we compare the different situations. As you can see, we degrade slightly the tracking, but it's still working. And also, we compare the same configuration of this controller with two control laws. So the first one, it was the PID, and the second one, it was a sliding mode control. And the control design, it has an effect also on the precision of the tracking. And as you can see here, we compare the RMS tracking errors. For both controllers, so the dark colors here, they are the PID and the light colors, uh, sorry, the inverse. The light colors is the PID and the dark colors is the sliding mode controller. And as you can see, for all the situations, whatever the error is, we have uh, better tracking performance in the sliding mode controller compared to the PID. And here, a real-time experiment, we start from this position. We do the tracking of this elliptical trajectory. Actually, this fin is not working. As you can see, it's not moving and we use three fins. We did first the experiment for 
controlling those degrees of freedom to track the elliptical trajectory where we have four fins, and then we stopped one of the fins, it's not working, and then we repeat the same experiment and you compare the results. And actually here we need to uh, measure the position and x, x and y. And we use, uh, we use these tags, as you can see here, to get the position x uh, and y, because we cannot measure them otherwise. And the other four degrees of freedom are, are measured using the IMU and the depth sensor. More details also, they are in the papers if you want. And, uh, uh, and this is the last scenario. And let me conclude the presentation. Actually, so the, the problem that I want to try to present today, it concerns the control of bio-inspired underwater vehicles. And as I explained, the general context, so those vehicles, uh, the case of UCAT, it's used for underwater archaeology, for inspection applications, go inside confined uh, environments. Uh, we were faced a lot of challenges, so uh, highly nonlinear carbon dynamics, the, the, the nonlinear dynamics of the vehicle itself, but we add the dynamics of the fins also, which is highly nonlinear also and very complex. Uh, some parameters are not known or time varying. We have a lot of uncertainties. We have the problem of underactuation. We have the problem of external disturbances. Uh, some states are not measurable and so on. And we propose different control solutions that I introduced it. I told you there is one control solution that I didn't introduce here because it's under publication where we, we designed these infinity solutions and we use an optimization to control the six degrees of freedom. So it's possible to control six degrees of freedom using only four fins. And uh, we did like a tracking of elliptical trajectory like that uh, going down. And uh, we validate, so in uh, open water, on a simulator, and for different uh, operating conditions. And uh, we did all the experiments on this UCAT and the water vehicle. And to finish, let me thank the persons who worked with me uh, on this topic. So first of all, Maria and uh, different students. So students who worked on this, on this topic, Victoria, she is actually in the US, she did a PhD there, and she just finished her PhD, so she worked on the vision-based control. And Mart on the acoustic-based control, uh, Tavi and Keiu on the position control, and uh, Walid who worked actually on the uh, hybrid uh, or a data fusion controller, and he's preparing his PhD in two weeks, he will uh, sorry, in December, he will defend his PhD. So with this last slide, I finish my presentation, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We are uh, running short of time. One question can be allowed. Just one question. Okay. Uh, I would give a chance to the student. <laughs> thank you. Hello, sir. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I have two questions. So yeah. first one is, uh, you employed many... So <laughs> I'll club these two questions. Then. <laughs> you employed diverse control uh, controllers. So right. why it is so? Could you repeat? You employed uh -huh. diverse control controllers. Yeah. So why it is so? And is there any selection criteria behind this? Ah, yes. Very nice. For sure, we designed a lot of controllers. We compare some of them. They have advantages, disadvantages. I think it depends on the application, what you want to do first, and then what is the, the, the measurement that you want to use. If you want to use the, the acoustic signal or the vision signal or both, you understand? So it depends on the application. It depends on what you want to do, the application itself. If you want to do tracking of a uh, fixed, tra fixed um, target or you uh, want to follow a moving target. Now, in terms what is the best controller, we didn't compare. We compare some of them for some specific situations, but comparing all the controllers with for different situations, no, we didn't do this. But the work is going on, and we will continue developing more and more and more controllers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to call upon uh, Antonio. Antonio Pascual to give our speaker the present.